I am very excited to be joined once again on the channel by a candidate running for Congress in New York's 10th district. Jonathan Herzog, welcome back to The Damage Report. Thank you for having me again. Good to see you, John. Uh, good, good to see you. Good to see anyone, honestly, anyone healthy. <laughs> um, so the last time we spoke was back in August of last year. It's been a bit. It's uh, you know, it's possible some people in the audience might not be familiar with your with your candidacy. Can you so can you tell us a little bit about what brought you uh, into politics? Absolutely. Well, I'm Jonathan Herzog. I'm running for Congress in New York's 10th district, which is the west side of Manhattan and South Brooklyn. It covers the world's financial capital. Um, but one in six folks live in poverty, live below um, the federal poverty line and can't meet their basic um, basic needs. It's in many ways the ground zero, the epicenter, the, the microcosm for our winner take all economy, where on opposite sides of the street, you have luxury housing developments. And on the other side, you have squalor and uh, New York City public housing. And I came to run for Congress um, through my work on Andrew Yang's campaign, um, where I left and joined his campaign as the sixth hire um, to build and kick off the Iowa operation um, and help turn uh, Andrew into the internet candidate um, mm. and help bring universal basic income to the fore uh, into the mainstream of the national conversation. Awesome. And uh, we're certainly going to be talking about um, UBI and how it's one of the most prominent policies being talked about right now a little bit later on. Um, so uh, he obviously developed into this superstar. Now you're running for Congress um, against uh, Jerry Nadler, who's a, a pretty well-known incumbent, by the way. Um, he's held the seat for seven years now. So tell me a little bit about the decision to challenge him. Um, in what ways do you think that Jerry Nadler isn't sort of living up to uh, what he should in that position? Yeah, well, he's he's held the seat um, for about 30 years, as it was gerrymandered in various ways. But really, it has nothing to do with him. It has nothing to do with our establishment legacy politicians and institutions and systems that are just catching up to the tectonic shifts in our economy and technology and in the pandemic today. It has to do with with our vision. And really, I have to say, you know, thank you. And so such incredible inspiration to the work that um, the Bernie movement and Justice Democrats and brand new Congress and this entire wave of a new generation of leadership that uh, is fighting unabashedly for new progressive reform. Um, and so it was truly inspired by that to be a part of a wave of freedom Democrats running on the Yang Yang agenda, beginning with this universal basic income, a new floor, a new right of citizenship uh, below which no one can or should fall in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Do you think that um, the experience of the past few years, I mean, you referenced Bernie Sanders there, do you think that the, the issues that Bernie Sanders and other you know related politicians or ideologically similar that they've raised, do you think that that is increasing the percentage of the population that is willing to question some of these long-term incumbents and and not just assume that if this has been my representative, this should be my representative for the next you know one to three decades? I think certainly it has fundamentally changed the dynamic of who can run, of who we think can run, and the amount of money you need to win. Uh, and certainly we need to move towards public financing of elections and fundamental campaign finance reform, but it really has upended some of our basic assumptions that we have to accept multi-decade incumbents who've never faced serious primary challengers in their entire careers. So it's thanks to that leadership and that wave of new young leaders um, that we've challenged the basic assumptions of what it means to represent our communities. Well, you know, so you mentioned that there's you know, we're rethinking for some of these candidates rethinking how to raise money and, and hopefully raising, again, the percentage of the population that is at least questioning where a politician's money comes from. Um, but while we're talking right now, obviously, we're m most of the country is under lockdown. Um, how is that influencing both the way that you're campaigning, but also the way that you're raising funds to continue this uh, this campaign? Yeah. And so the the scope and scale of this crisis is really unprecedented. You know, we're talking about 10 million filing for unemployment and projections of 30 percent, uh, 30 percent of the country uh, facing unemployment. So we're like we haven't even fully processed the scale and scope and shock and just sheer travesty um, and loss of life that we'll be going through. But in, in the context of the campaign, tragically or ironically, this is the Yang Yang strong suit in that um, we uh, brought these ideas to the fore uh, in the absence of mainstream media and institutional support uh, and a lot of 
gatekeepers and barriers to entry. So in many ways, the digital online organizing, being a group of digital natives um, and having a model of distributed organizing um, and work is kind of at the core of our being and at the core of the movement itself. And, you know, I'm also curious, this is something I've been been talking about with a few primary challengers recently. Um, so as you point out, I mean, you come from the section of the party that is probably most primed to do this sort of digital campaigning. But do you feel that being in this extended crisis, do, do you worry at all that that might that might make it more difficult in an unequal fashion that that incumbents who are going to be able to rely a little bit on their name recognition, institutional support, you know, decades in some cases of fundraising, that they might have an exaggerated advantage in a time where some of the more traditional canvassing opportunities, those sorts of things are pretty severely constrained into the near future. Certainly power and legacy systems of power never give way on their own. And we see this really clearly in the recent Supreme Court ruling, where at every single um, chance that institutions and systems of power have, they will defend um, the, defend that power and usurp and suppress the vote and, and the democratic process. And we're seeing that with a constant evolution of what voting looks like, even in the first place. So mm -hmm. certainly um, that's the case, but that's the backdrop we're working with. Um, and history has shown us that, um, you know, it'll take It'll take many, it'll take a wave, it'll take a movement, but we can certainly make meaningful, significant dents and put up some big wins on the board. Check out the Damage Report podcast each day, wherever you get your podcasts, whether Pocket Cast or Stitcher or iTunes. You can join me as I give you the news and stories you want with a range of co-hosts and interview guests jumping in on the fun each day. Again, that's the Damage Report, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you get them at iTunes, don't forget to rate and review. Sometimes I'll read them live on the show.